Welcome to God of Run. This is Will Sanchez. This is a very special episode of God of Run. We're dedicating the show to the people of Nepal. Nepal had a earthquake earlier this year. My guest tonight is Brittany Myers. She is a mountain runner and a photographer. I was introduced to Brittany at the Mile High Run Club, where we met to discuss some possible options to provide relief for Nepal. I am thrilled to have Brittany on the show. Thanks, Will. I'm excited to be here. Excellent. Before we get to Nepal, mm -hmm. let's introduce the audience to you. For example, tell us about your childhood. Sure, yes. I grew up in southern Ontario, Canada, um, in a very nice little town on Lake Ontario. Um, grew up doing a lot of sports, a lot of running. My dad was a marathon runner, and I was always inspired by him, wanted to be just like him. Uh, when we were kids, we used to watch my dad run the New York City Marathon. We'd either come to New York or we would watch it on television, and I always said, one day I'm going to do that. <laughs> so as soon as I graduated from school, I moved to New York City. I've been here ever since, and I've been running the New York City Marathon almost every year that I've lived here. Oh, cool. Let's go back to yeah. the school. What did you uh, study in high school and college? So I went to a private boarding school for high school, actually, which was a unique experience. I got to meet a lot of people from all over the world going to school there. Um, it's funny that a little town in Canada really brought people from, from everywhere to it. And that was part of the reason that I had the sports education. The school was very focused on sports. I played, um, I played high school girls rugby, actually, in the beginning. I did track and field, uh, which was great. But yeah, it was a um, really interesting kind of growing place to grow up, really well, beautiful let's, place let's to grow up. Let's give a shout out to the name of the school. Oh, it's called Ridley College. <laughs> Ridley College. And then I went to college in, um, in Ottawa, Ontario, and uh, at Carleton University. Studied English literature. I thought I'd become a writer. Um, and funny enough, I, I started doing photography instead of, of writing more. So. Did you study photography at college? No, I never studied photography. I have uh, just always had an interest in it. And, kind of been inspired to take photos because of the places that I visited, just being inspired by the landscape and environment okay. around me. Were you athletically involved when you were in college? In college, I just ran a lot. I just sort of started to get more into running and more into running on a personal level, not so much uh, on a team thing. So. Okay. So after college, you know, you needed to decide a career for yourself. You were yeah. an English major. Yeah. So how did you <laughs> make that uh, decision or transition? Oh, it's funny. It's, it's even before deciding on the career itself, which I guess I had no idea about right, right at first, I decided New York City was the place I had to live. You know, that was going to define what I did with my career and what I did, I guess, with everything else. And so I moved here. Um, I went to FIT, actually. I uh, did a couple of, I did a small, like, year-long program there in uh, business ownership. So what is FIT? Uh, fashion Institute of Technology. Okay. Thinking that I actually wanted to get into sort of the fashion world, um, very quickly realized that wasn't the, the place for me, um, but was, did get a really interesting education in, in business ownership and business development there, um, which led me to start working with some design firms and I uh, started working in brand strategy, which is, which is where I am now mm -hmm. um, professionally. Okay, cool. Now, you said you loved the New York City Marathon yeah. because your father was running it. Yeah. So tell us about, was New York your first then? New York was my very first. Well, tell and us about that. Yeah, I, I will. So 2007, um, it's actually a funny story. My dad, so I always thought my dad was like the greatest hero in my life growing up. Just um, interesting person and, and always someone that I could look up to. Uh, so he was a runner, ran marathons every year, couple of year. Um, he's logged every single one of his runs since like the 1970s or something like that. Mm -hmm. He actually doesn't run anymore, unfortunately. But, you know, I, there's just something really interesting about that to me. And it's such a personal sport for him. So I grew up watching him do that. In 2007, I had been living here for a year. And, and I said, okay, this is the year I got to do it. We didn't get in through the lottery at first, and we were a bit um, disappointed that the two of us, even though my dad had run it so many years, the both of us didn't get in. And so we waited. Um, we actually ended up getting in through a Canadian tourism company, which was kind of interesting. And it was sort of the last minute. It was like a month before the actual race. Uh -huh. So the very next morning after I found out that I had gotten in, I woke up, I think it was 3 o'clock in the morning. I planned to do a 20-mile run that day. I had been training, but you know, not, not enough, so I needed to get my long run in. Woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning. It was like a Wednesday. I had to go to work and everything um, and, and got up and ran all the way up to the George Washington Bridge and back from where I lived at the time, um, which was one of the most incredible New York City experiences I've ever had because it was quiet and desolate and 
a beautiful spring, dark morning. It was just an amazing, amazing And you experience. did it by yourself? Uh, I had a friend join me for about 10 miles. Um, I kind of felt like I needed a little bit of, I was, you know, I didn't know the city that well yet, and I felt like I needed a little bit of um, a guide, support yeah. and a guide. Uh -huh. It was a little bit scary to be up that early by myself. But okay. what a cool adventure it was. Oh, I bet it was. Uh, were you a member of a club at that point? or? New York Roadrunners. I'd, I'd started running with them when I first moved here. and, and yeah, Tuesdays uh, and Thursdays uh, yeah, evenings. Yeah, yeah. And it, I think in those days, about 10 years ago, it was, it was a lot calmer. It was a lot quieter. There wasn't quite as many people doing the races. It wasn't as hard to get into them. It felt a little bit more like a community, like kind of a close-knit community. Yes, yes, really yes. That's that. true. Yes. Yeah. Things have changed a lot in the last 10 years. They have. They have. <clears throat> so, so you and your dad uh, got to the starting line of the 2007 marathon, injury-free. Oh, yeah. That so must have been. Uh, yeah, injury-free. Um, had an amazing sort of couple hours in the waiting area at the fort, um, just hanging out together, the, the excitement building, like just knowing this was going to be my first marathon, and sort of also knowing how epic the New York City Marathon is because of having watched it my whole life. Um, favorite part was when we got on the bridge. We, my dad made sure we got on the upper level of the bridge. Uh, we got into our corrals. We made sure that we were in the same corral and s sang the uh, anthem. And just like, it was such an emotional moment. The two of us were very like rah-rah and excited. Uh -huh. and, um, and then running across the bridge together. We didn't run um, side by side the entire race, but the, for the bridge we did. Uh, lost each other probably after the first 10 miles, but every now and then I'd see my dad always wore a Canadian flag running and every now and then I'd see him I'd just see this flag kind of flash flash behind somebody or a, a, You know going by and I'd be like dad So he was up ahead of you. He was always up ahead and, and funny thing though He at one point I did pass him and then he ended up finishing before me no idea what happened or you know How he ended up getting ahead, but well your first, so he knew how to pace first. himself. Yeah, he totally knew it was up, and I was just like <laughs> trying to make it work. Well, it sounds like you had a terrific first time. Oh Do you remember hilarious. your time? Oh, it was four hours and 40 minutes, something like that. Okay, well, not too bad for yeah, first one. And, you, and it, obviously, you were there to enjoy the experience. Oh, yes. I, and, and, you know, the other best part was um, I'm sure you're familiar with the sort of the walk of the dead at the end of the marathon or at the end of any race where everyone just kind of is not. You know that shoot. Everyone's got to walk for a couple of miles, or, to or their, to get their bags. Uh, Everyone's covered in those space blankets, yeah, yeah, and yeah. I thought, "There's no way I'm ever going to see my dad in this sea of people covered in their space blankets." And then, long behold, I hear someone yell, "Dolly," which is his nickname for me, and he's he's behind me, been looking for me the whole time. And Hello, we Dolly. Embraced, <laughs> and people around were like clapping. It was just the coolest thing ever. Wow, you were always interested interest in photography and reading mm -hmm. your bio. Yeah. It says you're a photographer. Yeah. So when did you make that more of a hobby? Sure, yeah. I mean, and it's funny. I, I haven't always called myself a photographer. It's something kind of new. I've, it's been a hobby of mine. It hasn't ever been really a professional pursuit in any way. It's something I just love to do. Um, but uh, I guess I got into it um, when I started traveling more um, as a young adult. I uh, started to go to more exotic and foreign places and it was always an interesting way for me to capture the feelings and experiences that I was having in those moments. Photography was a way to really kind of try to take something home with me and take a memory home with me and, and share it with people. Okay, well, what kind of cameras did you use? <laughs> uh, well, right now I'm using a mirrorless camera. Uh -huh. It's a great camera, it's small. I mean, I've always chose which camera to buy based on how I could pack it in my backpack because I'll usually be you know, walking my, okay. my own way anywhere or even bringing it up a climb with me. I do a lot of rock climbing. So it's always got to be a small and light camera, so a mirrorless okay. camera is perfect for that. Okay, cool. Have you ever used a GoPro? So yeah, I've, I have never used it. People say I should, and I'm, I'm thinking about it one of these okay. days. Well, I mentioned you were a mountain, a mountain runner, mm -hmm. which is something I wasn't familiar with. So tell us, uh, what is mountain running, for example, sure. and, uh, and tell us about a couple of them that it's memorable for you. Sure. So I had never done any trail running before I moved to Ireland. I moved there in 2009 for graduate school and got involved in the Irish Mountain Running Association. So I didn't know what mountain running was either at the time. Um, I'd heard about trail running, but having lived in a big city, it, it just had never been something I did. Um, but that's what they did in Ireland. That was sort of the main kind of running community was around mountain running. So I joined this group of people, amazing, incredible close-knit group. There'd be weekly races and it would, it would take place outside of Dublin in the hills, in the Wicklow Hills and 
It's beautiful, full, beautiful environments and beautiful landscapes. And your camera's probably calling out to be. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what did I, you Ireland got a lot of photography. Oh, photography. I love to study in Ireland, by the way. I studied marketing. Marketing. I studied marketing, yeah. It's, okay. it's um, sort of how I've uh, evolved into sort of a brand consulting role, which is what I do professionally. But, okay. Um, All right, we'll get into that. did a little studying of photography, too, even though it, it wasn't a professional study, but yeah. Okay. Well, so it sounds like mountain running is, is, is trail running, what's to call trail running in the States, but yeah. perhaps to call that yeah. mountain running in Europe? Yeah, I get the impression, I might not, this might not be true, I'm not sure, but it, I feel like in, um, in Europe, it's often called trail or mountain running, and we refer, refer to it as trail running. Trail running. Well, I have to tell you, it sounds a little sexy you're calling it mountain running <laughs> because cool, right? it gives you visions of, you know, going up and yeah. touching the sky. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Ireland uh, is is very hilly, right? So you got to imagine that that almost all the trail running that you do there is there's a lot of elevation gain and loss and. Well, you, you know Swoops, right? I do. Yeah. yeah. She, met, oh, well, I haven't met her in person, but I've heard about her. Yeah. Well, she's from Nepal, and I had her here. Mm -hmm. It's just a funny story because she was talking about mountains. Yeah. And she was saying, I don't know why they call mountains in the States. We call them hills <laughs> back in Nepal. Yeah. And of course, they got the most famous mountain, Mount oh Everest. My gosh, yeah. And they consider, they consider the thing so they run hills. Well, yeah. I, I could get the perspective. Yeah. Those are mountains. <laughs> it's funny because in Ireland, they're definitely not mountains. They're definitely hills. And I've heard it referred to as hill running as well. Well, tell us about the first one that you. Did you call it conquer or ran or, or both? Yeah, well, the first couple of mountain races, or I guess you could call them races that I did, were with the Mountain Running Association. And so, like I said, they had weekly races. You know, as much a uh, sort of group run as it was an actual race, um, but you did wear a number, you did get your time um, recorded, and they did take photography, which was pretty amazing. They had, um, you know, like a, an events photographer take photos at every single race. I don't even know if you could ever get that in, in New York because it's so expensive, but it was such a small group and there's people willing to do it. And because the environment is so incredibly gorgeous, we got these great photos from it. Wow, what you call it event photographers? Yeah, so event, more than one, you mean? I think there was a couple. They're always like stashed throughout the course, uh -huh. and, and you know, you'd come up over a big hill, and they're, they're, they they're, there they'd be, and you get a great ah, photo. Ah, so they probably knew the best spots. Yeah, I think so. I, I would imagine nowadays with drones being more popular, oh, that's yeah. like a perfect spot true. to have yeah. drone photography. Yeah, that's you actually know, a good point. You could probably get into that, you know, <laughs> yeah, so you control it. as you have to learn how to control one of those things. I'm not so Maybe sure a future event for you. Yeah. That led to me going to Chamonix, Mont Blanc, uh, you know, in, in France, Chamonix in the French Alps, where I did a race called the Mont, Mont Blanc Cross, which is a pretty significant um, mountain run or race um, that gains a lot of elevation, quite uphill, really hard. It took me, it was a, ha it's a half marathon distance. It took me the, about four hours, so the length of a traditional sort of flat marathon for me. And it was an incredible, incredible experience. Such a beautiful place to run. I mean, to me, the, the appeal of mountain running or, or trail running is the, is the environment, is what you get to see. Mm -hmm. You might not see otherwise. You have to use your own human power to get to these places. Oh, absolutely. Now, do you also climb mountains? Because I mean, you mentioned hiking. Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, I do a lot of hiking. I also do a lot of rock climbing, um, like vertical uh, rock climbing, as well as more technical like trail uh, hiking and walking. And okay, like that. when you ran those mountains, just did that give you a, an incentive? I also want to climb it, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was running around near in the vicinity of Mont Blanc, which is the tallest mountain in Western Europe. And a friend of mine was with me at that during that trip, and she's also a climber. So the two of us went and actually summited Mont Blanc together. Um, actually the day after we, we finished the race, so. The half marathon, yeah, the Yeah, the half marathon totally destroyed us, and then the very next day we went and started climbing Mont Blanc. It took us two days. Stood on the summit of Mont Blanc at 6 a.m. on a beautiful, calm July morning. Incredible, incredible experience. I would like imagine. Now, I've talked to other ultramarathoners, and one of the challenges they face is the uh, is the altitude, you know, the thinning air. Is that a problem in mountain climbing where the air gets thinner? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So how do you compensate for that? You have to acclimatize. you got to go slow. Um, I mean, it's very true with just about anywhere that you go where there's a, a substantial elevation gain. Um, Mont Blanc happens to be quite low. It's only 14, 15,000 feet or so. Um, but Nepal, for example, even trekking to Everest Base Camp or any other part of, of the Himalayas, 
you really do need to go slow and, and acclimatize as best you can. Okay, so the secret is slow. Secret In fact, is slow, one of the which is my like mantra. I like, kind of like slow. <laughs> one of my guests says one of the mantras for ultra running, if you think you're going slow, mm -hmm. go slower. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I really like that. I'm not. I'm not much of a speed person, which is what, kind of I think what got me into ultra running too. You like the the experience. Yeah. We're dedicating the show to the people in Nepal mm -hmm. who are right now suffering or trying to get back from an earthquake, mm -hmm. as well as aftershocks. I think sure. weeks later they had three hundred plus aftershocks. Oh, that's, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. And it's such a far away place. It's, mm -hmm. it's everybody knows about it for its mountains. Yeah. But you were there right before the earthquake. So tell us uh, how that trip came about, and uh, and tell us the. It's your story. Sure, sure. Um, so it was actually my honeymoon. Ooh. Got married in January. Of this year? Of this year. Well, congratulations. Thank you so oh, much. Oh, you're still on your honeymoon. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> it's, only, it's only six months, seven I, months. I'm still a newlywed, which is great. Um, my husband and I always wanted to go to a place that really suited our personalities and that we had never been. Both of us have done a substantial amount of traveling. But Nepal had been a place that was on our list forever and um, just made sense for us. Both are, we're both climbers, we're both adventure seekers, um, so it just felt like the right spot. We trained for it, you know, we got really ready for it. We did, um, our plan was to spend a month hiking in the Sulukumbu region of Nepal, um, which I remember Swoops was actually talking about this in her, in her chat with you. Okay. Um, this is the, the region of Nepal where a lot of the Sherpa, the ethnic group, the Sherpa people live. Um, so we spent um, a month there, and we trekked um, into different areas of this region. Uh, we were close to Everest Base Camp when the, the earthquake occurred, um, which was just obviously something we could never have imagined. Um, it was crazy. Ooh, were Shocking. you asleep? Or were you at, what was the activity that had happened? I think it was about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, Nepal time. Um, and we had just, uh, so let me see how I can describe it. So we had actually been in this part, this region called Gokio. And from Gokio, we were going to be taking this high mountain pass that would bring us really close to Mount Everest, to the base camp of Mount Everest. Mm -hmm. and, and we were on our way to that high mountain pass. So we were pretty high up in altitude at this point. It's quite cold where we are, and it was snowing. It had been snowing for a couple of days, or I guess about a day or so. We had just arrived to sort of where the pass begins, where this part, portion of the trail begins. And we were going to have to go on and, and um, kind of, once you start this section of the trail, you, you can't like, there's nowhere to rest, there's nowhere to take a break. So you really have to be prepared to walk for about eight hours plus, um, have all your food and water and everything that you need on, in your backpack. Wow. And so we were about to go and do that and that's, uh, we were sort of in that next, that last spot right before you begin the, the pass when the earthquake happened. We felt it. I mean, it was. It felt like you were standing on a waterbed. You know, like it, it was really intense. It was your first earthquake? First earthquake I've ever experienced. Okay, so how how did guys feel? I mean, uh, uh, it was frightening. You, you, you knew it was a serious thing. Yeah, we were in a Sherpa lodge at the time, and it was there was not very many people there. There was about two, there was two other foreign trekkers, and then the the local two two locals that worked at the lodge. Mm -hmm. um, they, the, the locals sort of had this initial reaction that it was extremely bad and, you know, they didn't know how, how bad, but they knew it was bad. So that kind of made us all a little bit, a little bit scared. Of course, yeah. Um, we'd also had some friends that we had met along the way on our hike. We'd already been hiking for about 10 days at that point that were supposed to be just behind us. And we had to cross a big glacier that morning, and that's kind of a dangerous crossing. So we were worried about not having seen them and, and were they stuck on the glacier and where were they. So we actually went back to the glacier to look for them. Um, there was a lot of chaos in the beginning. There yeah. was a lot of just, there wasn't any information. All communications were down, um, phone lines and, and uh, Wi-Fi, everything was down. It was down. So there was really, all we kind of knew for the first couple days was it's bad, but how yeah. bad, we just we just didn't. Okay. We saw a lot of the destruction. Okay, you did. I know you took your camera out. Did you I take did. Uh, photographs? Can you I tell did. us about any of the photo photographs you took? Sure, yes, yeah, I, I took a lot of photographs of what we saw along the way. I thought it was important to document that. I think in, in a lot of these places, all, while these are heavily trafficked hiking and, and trekking trails, even you know trails that, that connect village to village, so even locals are, are walking these trails on a daily basis, we still felt like um, there's not a ton of people out there, especially in this portion, the Gokyo Valley where we were. 
the morning after the earthquake, we headed down the Gokyo Valley to a larger village where we, we assumed we could meet some people that might have more information and maybe even find a working landline. And on that trip, um, we did take a lot of photos. I took a lot of photos of, of homes that we saw that had, that had fallen over, a lot of just sort of flattened villages, you know, parts of villages that were just completely flattened. Mm -hmm. Definitely saw some landslides. We actually saw some landslides happening in the moment of some of the aftershocks. Oh, wow. Your family must have been terribly worried. Were you able to get a hold of them? <laughs> yes, they were very worried. My mother said she didn't sleep for a couple nights. Uh, I felt so bad about that. But um, How did you guys connect? So we finally were able to get a, to get a landline that had a little bit of, it, it was very hard to hear, but we were able to reach um, my fia my husband's family. I was almost going to say fiance, but he's my husband now. <laughs> my fiance hus at the time? Yeah. No, you no, were honeymoon. We were, we honeymoon so That's yeah. right. You're still, still <laughs> nearly wet. <laughs> still, yeah, exactly. I'm not used to it yet. But we were able to find a landline in this town. It's called Periche. We were able to make a call. Unfortunately, in the middle of the afternoon in Nepal, it's the middle of the night here in, in New York, so it, we had to wake them up, get them out of bed, and, and it kind of frightened them. Because I'm sure your mom didn't care. To, yeah, but it was hard to hear no. us. It's hard to get the information okay. through. Um, so that was a little bit difficult for us. It took us a couple more days to get to. There was one spot in the Sulu Kumbu region that we were in. Um, in the Himalayas that had Wi-Fi. It was one person's home who, um, he still had a satellite Wi-Fi connection. No one really knew why he was the only person to have it, but people came from 20 miles in, in every direction to this one um, lodge to be able to use this Wi-Fi. So we finally made it to that place, and we were able to get on the Wi-Fi and send a couple emails out and connect with people and let them know that we were okay. Okay, yeah. So that, that felt good to be able to just kind of get the message out and... <sighs> I gotta catch my breath hearing yeah. the story. But while while this is happening, you must have been thinking, well, how do we get out of here? Uh, you uh, know, you yeah. probably want to go. Yeah. Obviously, your friends and family want you at home as quickly as possible. What was the process there? Yeah, I mean, the first thing we had to do is figure out: is it possible to get out? Is it safe to leave the Himalayas and go back to Kathmandu? And as you probably know, it was not um, a good idea to get to to go to Kathmandu in the first couple days after the earthquake. It was it was crowded. It was dangerous. It was. Um, there's a lot of people uh, crowding in at the airport in Kathmandu trying to leave. Um, and so it was actually safer for us to stay in the Himalayas where we were. We kind of um, band together with a couple of other foreign trekkers and sort of stayed put in one of the lodges for a couple of days. Um, did a couple of, you know, just local hikes in this region just to check out things um, each day. But we just sort of stayed put for a little while. That seemed like the safest thing to do, and we later found out that it really was a good choice given the, the chaos what, that was happening. Was there a, a one person or a leader that knew what was going on or gave good advice? You know, that's the, the funny thing is, I, I guess this is what happens in natural disasters, and I'd never been in one, so I wasn't aware of it, but it, it was sort of a rumor mill. No one had really any solid information because even, I think, 10 days after the earthquake, um, when we were still in the Himalayas, there were no um, there were no phone lines. I mean, the Wi-Fi that this one person had, it was spotty. It took a long time to get through. Yeah. You could maybe send out one email in 30 minutes. So it wasn't like anyone was getting any solid information. Yeah. So people knew things, and there was sort of a lot of there was a lot of information being passed around, but it, no one really knew for sure, <laughs> you know, anything until we got back to Kathmandu and saw it with our own eyes. Yeah. It was hard to know, yeah. Uh, but we did eventually get, um, we, we were able to hike back over to Kathmandu. And we actually, we hiked to a village called Lukla and took a small plane back into Kathmandu. And from there, um, we were able to fly out and back on the, on the way towards home. We didn't, it took us a couple more days to get home, but. Wow. It took a long time, but it was, um, you know, we feel extremely lucky and so fortunate to be have been safe and uh -huh. have been just in the right place at the right time. Wow, oh, that's a tremendous. Now, are you planning to go back, or, or what's your some yeah. of your thoughts about helping the people in Nepal? Sure, sure. So we we did meet a lot of people as we were as we were walking out of the uh, the Sulu Kumbu. We met a lot of people that were involved in efforts to help local villages and local villagers, um, and we got involved in some of those efforts. And now that I'm back here in the United States, um, just trying to, to do whatever I can, spread the word the best way that I can. And I'm actually going to be involved in a photo exhibit called Climb on Nepal next week, next mm -hmm. Wednesday night. And this is going to be a, a benefit um, for Waves for Water. We're going to be showing photography. There'll be some really amazing, famous photographers there from National Geographic. There'll be some sort of local hobbyists like myself. And all of us will be uh, auctioning off our photographs. 
and all those been all the the proceeds will go to to charity to help oh, Nepal. Oh, great. So I think that's one one little thing that we can do okay. that I think we're all really excited about. But but also I find that the best thing that we could probably do for Nepal right now is really get people excited and inspired and want to visit Nepal in the future. Uh -huh. You know, getting people to go there, um, encouraging tourism, they're really going to need a lot of help with that. Okay, and well. I'd and I'd love to, to share how inspiring and transformative the, the journey and the experience was for me and uh -huh. get other people to want to go. Okay, maybe we'll work on that if we come up with something. Yeah, that would be great. Let's That'd be do great. that. Well, let's talk a little bit about where we met. We met at the Mile High Run Club. Sure. Because yeah. each of us, both of us, had the idea of, of involving the Mile High Run Club with some kind of event. Sure, yeah. Uh, we're still to be worked on, mm -hmm. so we don't have anything to announce, folks. But tell us. What attracted you to the Mile High Run Club? I mean, you're a mountain runner, you know, and, uh, and now you're running on a machine. Yeah. What, uh, what's the... Uh... Yeah, it's funny that you ask that because I never thought I'd be running on a machine. I'm not, I'm much more of an outdoors person. I like to kind of be outside and, and get to experience the environment. But Mile High was a great experience for me because in terms of training, I mean, in order to not get injured, you need to train properly. And it was an opportunity for me to get to do my hill repeats in a, in a sort of safe setting um, and that was easy and close to home. Uh, and also do my speed work and um, be around other people that are pushing me. And I found that I'm actually pushing myself more on the treadmills than I would be um, you know, on, on the Harlem Hill or something like that just on my own. So that part's been great for me. Excellent, excellent. In closing, what are some of your challenges, both professionally and athletically? Sure. Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, athletically, I would say, you know, I, I'd love to find a way to merge more of what I do athletically because it's such a passion of mine with what I do professionally. I mean, I guess I can answer that question sort of together because uh -huh. I, um, I love running. I love adventure running. I love being outside, like I said. Um, and I love climbing. I want to find a way to make that stuff sort of go hand in hand with my work professionally. So as a branding consultant and, and also as a photographer. Well, excellent, yeah. excellent. Well, listen, thank you so much for coming in. This has been great. Awesome. It's been so fun. Thanks, Will. Pleasure. Great to meet you. Thank you. <laughs>